Malembe. I'm Melanie and I'm the link between St Denis and Exodus Church in Uganda. Um, a group of us visited Uganda in February this year and we were very grateful for the amazing support we had from everyone in St Denis and we were really keen to tell you all about it when we got back. But unfortunately, the Sunday we were going to feed back to you was the very first Sunday of lockdown. So um, here we are. Um, OK, so where is Umbale? So the journey from Cardiff to Kampala, the capital of Uganda, takes about 22 hours. And then it's another seven hour bus ride onto Umbale. Uh, Umbale is the fourth biggest city in Uganda, up near the Kenyan border and very little of the infrastructure has changed since Uganda gained independence in 1962. So I'd like to start by explaining our link with Exodus. So Chris Burr had visited um, Uganda a couple of times with Pont, a charity set up by Dr Jeff Lloyd. And Pont works by linking volunteers with direct community links with the aim of reducing the impact of poverty on the lives of those in Umbale. So when Chris came to St Denis, he was um, keen for us to have an anxious, uh, he was keen for us to have a meaningful relationship um, with an overseas link. And he suggested that we um, work with Exodus Church. So quite a few of us have had an opportunity of visiting Exodus. Um, there's been three trips altogether in 2017, 2019, and then in February this year. And each time we've stayed in Salem Village. From the very first moment we all walked into Exodus, we just felt an immediate bond with the people who were part of the church there. Um, we got Over the years, we've got to see a good many of the projects that Pont and Exodus support. And it's fair to say we've been blown away by the sense of community that they have there, the way they look after each other and share what little they have. They may be financially poor, yet their lives are rich. So St Dennis supported Andrew financially and prayerfully through his theological training. And since most ordained clergy in Uganda have to have another source of income, we have continued to do this today. But it's so much more than financial support. I know how much they value the fact that we here in Cardiff pray for Andrew, Alice, his wife, his two boys, Paul and David, and for everyone in the congregation at Exodus every Sunday. That just means so much to them. It's a real community church. They love coming together on Sunday morning. Uh, worship lasts at least three hours and um, many will have walked a few kilometres to get there, um, often barefoot, including um, an elderly blind man who's led on a piece of bamboo by a, a young teenage boy. Um, their faith is strong and worship is exuberant, uh, with lots of dancing around and the ladies ululating. They love to share testimony. And as we've shared our stories of loss, bereavement, life-threatening illness, and our desires for our families to know Jesus, they know too that we experience testing times and that we are reliant on him. So what's the structure of the church like? Well, it's a simple building, but um, the actual body of the church, the people, um, comprises of about um, 300 children who come along to Sunday school. They've got no facilities whatsoever. They just, they've got a couple of benches and the rest sit on the floor out in the open sunshine. And um, they will hear a story and sing. And they love to sing. Um, there are three choirs at Exodus Church. Um, and yeah, their singing is just amazing. Um, so each week then Andrew and his team go out into the community and they visit people in the more outlying visit, in villages. Andrew's got a bike um, and I think maybe they use a Buddha Buddha, which is what they call the, the scooters and motorbikes. 
Um, so he shares um, the word with them and prays with them. But they also undertake practical help, which you'll hear more about of. Uh, they get about 50 people to Bible studies on a Friday and lots of children to Bible club on a Saturday. Uh, so in total, there's about 200 adults, 100 young people and then the children. So I think you're going to see a video of worship at Exodus and then a recent video of Andrew and his family and their neighbours um, sharing worship together in the Andrew's home. Um, this was when lockdown restrictions had been lifted a little um, so they could meet together, but they still weren't allowed to meet as a church as a church congregation. The ARDI project is African Rural Development Initiative and it was set up to look after girl children who drop out of school and who are often thrown out of home due to becoming pregnant. Joseph Wiyusu and his team set out to give them a second chance with vocational training and education and in 20 years they've helped more than 1,400 young mothers. They're rightly very proud that many have achieved well and have succeeded in becoming doctors, nurses, teachers, as well as having vocational skills. They set up a nursery school for the children and now after 20 years they have year groups right through the nursery and primary levels with a standard of education in advance of the state system. It was my wish to see it again as it had a pro profound effect on me the first time and though it was a bit of a shock for some of our group, we saw much more moving situations later. Some of, some of the children are orphans and there are dormitories on site for boys and for girls. They're also running environmental projects and have nurseries for tree growing and with support from the Wales Government they've been very active in tree planting and honey production and we were all delighted to each plant a tree that afternoon. You'll see from the pictures how beautiful and smiley all the children are. Remember, they're either orphans or children of, of some very young mothers. But wherever we went, we were all so taken with them. You can see that this was day one for the parachutes and beach balls with the monies donated by our congregation and you can't ever imagine the joy and happiness it brought to these underprivileged kids. This worthy project, like many others in Uganda, depends entirely on donations, and they've built up links over the years, and there are groups and individuals who sponsor the children's school costs, as well as helping with running costs. But, as ever, there is never enough. And we must thank God for his support of the likes of Joseph and his team. So we visited the school in Sabusi. I think it was probably on our second day. Uh, and it's on the way to the, Gan uh, the Kenyan border. So a fair old distance for us to travel. Uh, it was an interesting road because it's, it's going to be a huge road when it's completed. But it's just being developed now. And so we had to dodge diggers and huge mounds and craters just to get to the school. But when we did, um, the welcome we had was quite awesome. 
Uh, we walked the last part of the the uh, from the entrance of the school to to see the children, and they were all lined up there. And we saw that wonderful Welsh flag and the Ugandan flag, and the children. There must have been probably five hundred of them, um, all stood there with their hand on their heart, um, singing the Ugandan national anthem. Which you know, I think hearing anyone sing their national anthem is awesome, and there in that setting it was just amazing. So from there we had a few introductions, uh, said who we were, uh, and I was, uh, yeah. So we were introduced to the children, and then we were paired off, and um, we were given an opportunity to visit various classrooms. And I was paired with a chap called Ben. Uh, ben was with St Paddens and part of our uh, our contingent. Uh, and we the class we went to is quite an interesting one because. We thought we were going to watch someone teaching, but we we were never quite sure whether the person with us was the teacher or waiting for the teacher. Either way, um, Ben and I found ourselves uh, singing lots of songs with the children, which had lots of actions. So they're Christian songs, but with actions, and we sang quite a few of those. Uh, and when we thought we'd, we'd sort of exhausted our repartee, uh, repertoire, rather, um, ben then recited or spoke, told the story of we're going on a bear hunt. And I have to say, he has so much, uh, he evoked such a, a wonderful uh, feeling of squelch and mud and everything that it clearly translated. Whether they understood the language or not, it didn't really matter. They were giggling away just watching Ben. So that was that was really rather lovely. And from there then, we went, um, we had a little wander around the school. And one of the things I meant to say was, but the, the the classes are not governed by age. So you are in a particular class because of the level you've got to in the school. So you could have quite a variety. You could have maybe seven-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 14-year-olds, because sometimes individuals had to drop out of school for whatever reason, and they'd go back to the class that they were originally, and they have to pass those certain milestones um, before they can move on to the next class. They're taught really by rote, so it's looking at... Uh, listening to the teacher, answering questions, using the chalkboard. Very few children had pen and paper. So it was quite, yeah, it's rote learning uh, and they're all sat at their desks. Um, but their thirst for learning was quite, quite real. And a lot of them had walked a very long way to get to school in the first place. We were then taken to have a little bit of something to eat, uh, which we were surprised at because we were expecting to have lunch at the next place. Um, but, you know, if people are giving you hospitality, then obviously you accept it. And we had some wonderful eggs, some absolutely beautiful fruit. Uh, we also had some meat. I'm not sure what the meat was. I think it was probably goat. Uh, and it tasted absolutely lovely, though. And then from there, we were um, given another treat. We were taken to this really big hall. And it was quite empty when we got there. And we sat in chairs, not knowing what was going to happen. And then gradually a table arrived and some different chairs. And we realised it was sort of almost like um, a meeting of the board of the schools, if you like. And so they read out the minutes of the previous meeting. And we were introduced to the the head, the deputy head and, and various other um, members of the board. And then to top it off, and what was absolutely lovely, um, a group of the children, probably about 20 of them, uh, entertained us with a play, play and dance all around um, a, a young person who caught malaria and what happened to that individual. And they had some wonderful costumes and some um, great bits of greenery. Uh, and although we didn't speak the language, you could really tell what was going on. You could understand the story. And we understood that they'd actually got to the finals of their local Eisteddfod. Well, the equivalent, I guess, of an Eisteddfod. Um, and had um, made it through to the nationals, uh, the national competition. But because they couldn't afford a coach there, um, then they weren't able to take part. Um, but I think for all of us, it was the opportunity to go and see an actual school, to see the dedication of the teachers and to really see how much Ugandans value and realise the importance of getting an education um, for their future, uh, future, life, uh, future lives within Uganda. I'm going to tell you about the Strong Foundation project set up by Pont in Namatala. Namatala is the slum area of Umbali 
And like all slums, it has the same problems of deprivation. The project takes orphans found in the most horrible circumstances and some very needy children. It feeds them twice a day, teaches them, and in some cases offers them a bed. It shows the children by what they do for them that God loves them. You can see from the picture the narrow open space where we and the children sat. We were in with the kindergarten children. They were so beautiful, so well cared for, washed, nicely dressed, and all of them had shoes. Some of the little boys even had football socks. All the teachers and helpers introduced themselves and proudly told us of the part they played with the children. All of them were such good Christians who had the best for the children in their hearts. We were entertained by the older children to a drama of the Good Samaritan. The teacher who had put it together knew the whole script and every part of each child and stood by nervously. They did her proud. Then came the meal, which I am sure all the children were waiting for. We'd never been so close at a meal time before, and it was a real eye-opener. They were fed porridge, absolutely standard fare in Uganda. It was served in green plastic mugs, which you can see in the picture, with the big ones helping the little ones, and the mugs going back to the kitchen for refills, as they didn't have enough mugs to go round. They were not washed, and out they came again. I look back on it and hope that coronavirus never gets into that place. Then we saw the dormitories. Children slept five in a single bed across ways. But at least they had a safe place to lay their heads for the night and would come to no harm. Then, like the Pied Piper, we all trooped down to the school, all the children running and laughing and so glad to show us around. There were four classrooms made of concrete, no water, no electricity, no windows, and they were all taught in English. They brought out a parachute and had such fun playing with it. They squealed with laughter, and you felt very much the place was set up and was very happy. We left them with lots of our resources, which had been paid for by the congregation, and I can tell you they were going to a very good home. Now this project is called the Hope Ministry. It was set up for women with HIV AIDS. The need for it was there because they would not take the med medication prescribed for them and decided to die rather than be a burden on their families. <clears throat> so Hope Ministry was set up to give them a safe place to live and be treated. <clears throat> All of them in the same boat, though there was no stigma and from this the community developed. It is run by Auntie Barbara, who you can see on the right hand side of the picture. A wonderful, clever, warm and compassionate woman who makes them feel loved and have self-worth, which was sadly missing in their lives before. You can see how they're dressed because they're all dressed up for the occasion, like we all like to do. They work making jewellery and handbags, brushes, etc., which they sell along with the garden produce they grow for themselves and the surplus is for sale. But now their latest project is honey. When we were there last time, it was just getting started. The hives were being constructed. This time we bought the honey. Excellent progress. No little children there this time, they were all at school. Lots of the women were quite shy, others quite gregarious. They sang for us and laughed together. I must say it was a pleasure to go and see them. It's a very successful project and if ever there was an apt name, the Hope Ministry is it. The Christian ethic which runs through the whole project is very uplifting. God's work in action. Hello everyone. Thought I should start by introducing myself. I'm Liz Fairclough and I'm good friends with Amanda. And it's through Amanda that I became involved in our trip to Uganda. 
When the opportunity arose, I asked Chris, who I'd previously met, who said I'd be more than welcome. Uganda had always been a country close to my heart, as my uncle had served there as a missionary priest for many, many years. As we are already seeing throughout this presentation, Pont thrives and sustains throughout the various communities in Mbale. And we had the opportunity to experience their work when we went to visit the Bursai community and Goat Village. We were led that day by Zebi, who is the livelihood coordinator for Pont. She is hugely respected in the villages. Her work is vital in providing links between Pont and the local people. We were all given a rapturous welcome on our arrival. The ladies from the village came to meet us, dancing and ululating with open arms. They provided us with a sumptuous meal prepared and cooked in the outdoor kitchen, which you can see on the slides. In addition to providing a watering station that you can see on a separate slide, families are also provided with a goat, a female goat. The community is given a male goat. Simon, one of the villagers, is the goat supervisor and it is his responsibility to take care of all the goats in the village. He is trained to provide basic veterinary services and to manage the male goat. The goats then breed and the first kid produced is passed on to other members of the village making the project self-sustainable. After this, the family can sell any future kids, providing income, which gives education, uniform for the children, nutrition and shelter for the family. Also, the goats produce manure for the crops, which means more vegetables to eat and more coffee to sell. Doreen is the goat supervisor's wife. Doreen runs activities for the women of the goat village. They produce beautiful craft work, which they sell, and they also grow vegetables for additional income too. This work goes a long way in empowering women and giving them recognition for their work. There is perhaps still a way to go here, but steps forward are definitely being made. As you can see from the slides, villagers really did welcome us with open arms. We visited homes and we sat with families. We were especially delighted and touched when tiny babies were placed in our arms. We had the most wonderful cutches and cuddles. And for me, this was one of the highlights of our trip. As you can see, we handed out brightly coloured knitted clothes made by people here in Wales for the babies and the young children. Mums were so delighted to see their babies dressed in them, knowing that they would have something warm and clean for them to sleep in during the cold nights. So that's the Bursai community and the Goat Village, which was a very, very special day and our trip itinerary. Feeding the elderly at Kamonkali this is one of the highlights of every trip to Uganda that we've all been on. Komonkali is where Exodus Church is situated and most of the old people are from the congregation. They're like old friends and we recognise so many of them from church and from previous visits. Old people in Uganda are greatly revered. They've had a very hard time and life expectancy is much lower than it is in the West. Many of these people have lost children because of AIDS, which hit Uganda very hard, and have had to bring up their grandchildren themselves. On our first visit five years ago, I met a man called Ben, who was 70 years old. He was very erudite and a church elder. He'd been a civil servant in Kampala and was a widower, but bringing up six orphans. These orphans were actually his family, sons and daughters of his son and his brother's son who had died of AIDS. I'm delighted to say he's still going strong and is one of the pillars of the church. The lunch is held at the Mara Clinic and they all gather in their finery. So colourful as you can see from the photographs. 
We entertain them with some singing and testimonies. The one thing they do love at Exodus is a good testimony. This day is one of the highlights of their year, and firstly we distributed bath towels to over 50 of them, which we'd all brought with us from home. You can see in the pictures some of them are carrying them on their laps. This year we also took fleeces for them, as even though Uganda is on the equator, they do feel the cold in the rainy season. The food, a hot meal, was being prepared in the kitchen. We then set up a chain, ferrying the meals all around the room, as well as distributing drinks. For some it was too much food, or they had someone at home that they were thinking of, so they came prepared and they had plastic bags to carry the food with them. As a result of our visit, they have now set up their own choir and were so impressed with our rendition to them on our first visit of Amazing Grace that that is what they've called their choir. This part of the trip is probably the most satisfying by giving so much pleasure to these lovely people. Hi, my name's Amanda and this was my very first visit to Mumbali. Um, we had a very action-packed programme whilst we were there and um, one day on the itinerary it said that we were going to be spending some time with Pastor Andrew in the community of Kamonkli. So we set off with Andrew um, to the outer parts of the community, um, quite rural um, but where lots of people who actually go to Exodus live. And we met Milton and Milton was um, a gentleman who Andrew had identified as somebody who would benefit from our help. Um, when we set off on this trip, we had said that we wanted to see some of the projects that um, Pont had worked so hard at and that many of the group had seen before to see the progress when we returned. Um, and we did that, but we also wanted to get our hands dirty and actually help. Um, so um, Milton is a gentleman in his 60s who had been paralysed from the waist down and has basically been abandoned by his family. So we entered Milton's home, which was just one room, um, really just a hut. Um, he had a bed and um, a fire on which he cooked his food and in the corner was a huge termite's nest. And so with Milton's permission, um, we set about clearing his house. I think it's fair to say that we had to dig really deep to do this. We got everything out of the house. Um, you'll see here that um, some of the team are actually washing the pots and pans, which were really in a really poor state. Um, we removed the bed from the home and um, that had lots of rags on it and was broken. So um, th with new with cutting down some trees, we actually made a new bed. Uh, many of you will remember Gaynor Higgs Jones, who was a curate in St. Dennis a few years back and she was with us and thankfully she's a scout leader so she was able to show us how to tie knots that would last um, so it was really great to have her with us um, and whilst we were um, clearing out the house making the bed etc we pulled our resources and um, some of the team went with a driver into the towns to buy a mattress and some sheets and some food for Milton. Um, this was a really, really emotional day for us um, and it was really emotional for Milton. He cried for most of the time that we were there. But what was absolutely fascinating was that word got round um, in the region that we were there and lots of people gathered to see what we were doing. And Andrew has said that this will really help his, him in his ministry because they don't expect white people to go along and actually help. And there was a real lesson there that he was trying to um, share with the community that they really need to look, start looking after their own people like Milton who need them. Um, and as you will see, um, Milton now is thriving. He's given his life to Christ. And what's really lovely is that Andrew sent some photos um, just last week um, of a widow who was in the same kind of position as Milton and the community have pulled together with his support and with his leadership to actually do what we did for Milton for her. So um, a really, really, really worthwhile day and uh, something that we hope one day when we go back we'll be able to do more work like this in the community. Okay. So if we stay in Mambale, we visited the Wildlife Education Centre. That is a dream of Dr Jeff Lloyd who is the founder of Pont. Um, that he is in the, in the process of setting up. Um, he does have some animals there at the moment and this is going to be an education centre 
to educate the children about the positivity of relationships with animals um, but also he hopes his vision is to have it as a tourist attraction and he we went to walk to the top of the mountain on which the um, center is built and there's a beautiful area the most beautiful um, location you can imagine that he hopes one day to have some huts that people can stay in people who may be visiting Uganda to see from Kenya to see the gorillas can actually um, go and stay there but within some sort of hotel style accommodation but at the moment this is just a clearing of land and it is surrounded by natural beauty um, that I can hardly describe. I think the photos here don't really do it justice but it was beautiful and we with the guides that we had there and um, Dr Jeff had an outdoor communion which was a really very very special time and it was actually a highlight of our trip. Um, I think we all experienced some spirituality there that we've not experienced before. Um, it was a very, very moving experience and it was lovely on our first day after 24 hours of travelling to come together in that way, to have communion and to go forward together on our trip. Um, and I really, really hope one day that we'll be able to go back and experience that again. Thank you. Children's Day at Exodus was the real point of this trip. Third visit, time to stop being bystanders and roll up our sleeves. Very different to planning a kids event at St Dennis. We didn't have to pray for good weather or for enough children to turn up. The real difference though, kit. Bats and balls, sticky stuff and scissors, videos, felt pens. Uganda doesn't have kit, just children. Loads of them. We couldn't take stuff for them all. And taking too little causes jealousy. Instead, we took playthings that later, after we'd gone, Exodus could replicate all by themselves. Simple cloth bean bags, glove puppets made by you, St Dennis. So thank you. Oh, and thank you, Christ the King, Lanishan, for providing Liz Fairclough, an ex-teacher, fountain of ideas, and a magical way with children. She was a godsend. So, the day itself. Well, we started by throwing bean bags to the children as they arrived. They'd never played catch before, no idea, but boy did they cotton on fast. More children arrived, more beanbags were thrown, and more, and more. Look, there's no photo of what happened next. You're going to have to close your eyes and imagine a blue, blue sky, a patch of grass, hordes of children and the air filled with joyous cries, cries and 100 calico beanbags flying in all directions. No one took a picture because we were all in the thick of it, having the time of our lives. Inside the church, children still arriving, we sang songs, action songs, and then stories. Two big Bible stories with visual aids for about 400 kids who'd never seen an illustrated book, or posters, or Bible animations, or lions, or zebra, or giraffes, even though they share a country with them. No worries, we had props galore, and the children not one single bit of bad behaviour out of any of them all day. Those children know how to listen. They know how to concentrate. They know how to assimilate a story into their bones. Every eye, every ear tuned to every word that was said. And bear in mind, please, that every word was said twice, first in English, then translated into their own language. First Noah's Ark, with 400 children processing round the building in teams of zebras and monkeys, elephants and kangaroos, all ages, big boys of 10 with a baby on their hip and a glove puppet on their hand, ready to wave it in the air at key points in the story, little dits in rags, proud girls wearing a third-hand t-shirt with sequins on the front. They sang the songs, they did the actions, they processed, they sat back down, they howled the wind, they drummed the rain, and they kept their beady eyes on Mr Noah. Thank you, Jeff Toy, a stunning performance, until they all landed safe and sound beneath the promise of the rainbow. And after that, the story of Jesus welcoming the children, puppeteered wonderfully by our team. So simple, but they had never seen the like. Then dinner, endless queues, plates heaped with hot food, bottles of pop, oh, not quite enough, an emergency dash to the local shop to make up their numbers. 
and then the two rainbow parachutes, one inside, one out, 30 children on each, lifting the parachute, bouncing a beach ball on the top, running underneath, shrieking with delight. Didn't all go to plan. Lunch was very late. The pastor's wife took over, entertaining the children when we ran out of steam, and most of the games we prepared got shelved. But at the end, we had no doubt. It had been a success. Never, said Pastor Apollo, never has there been a day like this. Never in all Uganda. This will be talked about for years. At Pont, the children's officer for the charity studied the beanbags and the glove puppets, then suddenly yelled and ran through the office. Look, look, sustainable toys. Now our children can have playthings. At the pensioners' lunch, when I was showing the Jesus puppet to Andrew's wife, some older women approached and asked if they could touch. We have seen pictures of Jesus, they said, but never with skin and hair like us. And their chins wobbled and tears stood in their eyes. Then after we'd gone home, Jana, at Apollo's wife, started reaching out to the street children of Mbale. Because of the story, she said, Jesus and the children, it made her think. I wish they could come three times to visit us. I wish they could spend two visits just watching us, observing. And then the third visit, they could spend one day giving to us what they can see we lack. So what of the future for Exodus Church in Kamonkali? I don't think any of us who've had the opportunity to worship at Exodus have failed to be blown away by the love, commitment and faith of the ever-increasing congregation that worship there. Uh, the fact that we had over 400 children there on our fun day was just absolutely awe-inspiring. Um, and it's because of the generosity of members of St. Dennis Church that the church in Kamonkali has been able to purchase its own land with the intention in the future of building a permanent church structure. At the moment, they rent a church on rented land, so have to clearly pay for that. Um, and there's always the chance they could be evicted from that land. So their future is assured in terms of having the land there. And then as and when funds become available, they will build um, a permanent structure. They've got toilets already. Well, they started building the toilet blocks, but that's 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 as far as it's got. Uh, and I just so and what I would say, though, is that what's so amazing is the faith and commitment of the the church family there and it's just so absolutely awe-inspiring and I'd like you to join me in a short prayer please for Exodus Church. Father God we thank you for your faithful church in Kamonkali, for Pastor Andrew and his faith and commitment and ask that you guide any future decisions in the church's development and provide wisdom to those involved. Amen. I hope this has brought back uh, lots of good memories to those who visited um, Umbale before and given everyone else an insight into, um, into Exodus Church. Um, St Dennis has supported us incredibly generously each time we visited. You saw the delight on the uh, faces of the elderly people as they were given a new bath towel and the joy that the simple toys such as the hand puppets and the bean bags gave to the children. Um, it was quite poignant that we had to show the parents how to play with the children because they just don't play. They don't have time, they don't have the resources to play. Um, and obviously you saw the squeals of delight from children and um, people of all ages as they played with the parachutes. Um, we were able to buy several of these and we left, we've left. we left them at various projects and orphanages and we know that they will give so much joy for many years to come. Um, I particularly like to thank McJays for their generous donation towards buying a parachute and hope you enjoyed seeing the children playing with them. Um, a few people have expressed um, a desire to donate further and if you'd like to do so, please get in touch with me. My uh, details are at the end of the presentation. Um, 
it doesn't have to be a large a large donation every five ten pound will go directly to the church community to buy essential items um i had a lovely surprise last week when i had a video call with pastor andrew um, it would appear that sub-Saharan Africa has escaped large numbers of deaths associated with COVID-19, but the implications of lockdown have been severe. Um, as I think we've explained before, most people are subsistence farmers, so they grow a little, sell a little and buy food. And with lockdown, the markets have been closed. Um, food prices rocketed and people were hungry. And this brought um, to the surface underlying problems associated with poverty and hunger and has led to increased violence, particularly domestic violence and teenage pregnancies. These are all things that uh, we've been asked to pray for and we know that they really do value our prayers. So shall we pray now? Lord. We pray for our friends and brothers and sisters in Christ at our partner church, Exodus, Umbale. We thank you for the friendship and fellowship that has grown among us and for the links we have here at St Denis. We ask you to be very close to them in these uncertain times. Protect them, we pray, and provide for all their needs. Encourage them and bring comfort and peace to them as they take refuge and shelter in you. Amen.